we're on. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Live with Leo at five. Um, I'm going to just uh, you know, pause for uh, a few seconds here and wait a little bit for people to jump on. There's always a little bit of Facebook delays here with the stream. So if you're on, please say hello. Um, let me make sure I'm monitoring the stream here. There we go. And hello, hello. Hi, if you're on and if you can hear me, please uh, comment the word. What's a good word today? Art. You can comment the word art and let me know that you are on watching live with us. I'm so glad you can join us. Um, so we have a special guest here today and um, I'll wait a few seconds here. Um, happy Tuesday. I almost thought it was Wednesday. Taco Tuesday. Um, Taco Tuesday, exactly. Yeah. Hope everybody's having a good Taco Tuesday. If you got tacos at home, bring it on and bring, bring it over to the screen and have some. And you know, you got to share. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Uh, thank you for joining. Hi, Nancy. Um, if you're, if you guys can hear me, please uh, put the word art in there and uh, I could see that you're watching. Hi, Kristen. Good to see you. Hi, Stefan. Great to see you guys. We've got a great, great interview for you in store today. You're going to be so excited. I've been waiting for this for weeks. For <laughs> weeks. <laughs> now you're building it up. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Welcome, welcome. All right. Uh, I want to get started here. I want to be respectful of uh, Mitch's time here. I have uh, Mitch Ritter. Did I say that your last name right? Is it Ritter? Ritter is correct, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Um, it's always a little tricky with the last name sometimes, but um, so Mitch Ritter, he is a, a local resident um, artist, uh, photographer, photojournalist um, here locally in Laguna, and um, he's an amazing, amazing artist, and um, I've seen a lot of his work, and also um, I've been able to uh, follow him around <laughs> digitally, and um, and see a lot of his uh, his work that he does, and it's just so amazing and so incredible. Um, sometimes um, I I've done a little bit of photography in my days, and I know how much time and effort and um, uh, the particular um, patience and skills required over the years in order to get those shots. And so um, I love to always talk with um, people like Mitch to to get their take on the situation. There's always a story behind every photo. So without further ado, um, I introduce to you uh, Mitch Ritter. Welcome, Mitch. Thank you, Leo. Thanks for having me. Afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, real quick, I know before we get started, it's it's been a little bit of a, um, a down mood, um, especially over this past week, and more, more, more importantly, more especially over the last few days, we're seeing a lot of things that have um, just been very disturbing and um, uh, I know that my heart is heavy, and so um, I wanted to still continue to do this show because I want to bring some value and positivity uh, to the world out there, but not discount, um, you know, those those people who are out there suffering, those people who are angry, and those people um, who are, you know, having a hard time. Um, my heart go also goes out to all the businesses who um, have worked so hard to build their business and just seems like you know, um, after the corona, coronavirus that taken a hit on them. And this is another hit on a lot of the uh, business owners out there. They, they are, you know, they are the bloodline, you know, of our economy, bloodline of our lives. And so my heart goes out to everybody. And, um, uh, but um, I hope that at least for a little bit of time with us that we can, you know, enjoy, you know, some, some sense of normal, normality, if that's a word, um, with uh, what we normally do and what we're passionate about. And today, um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for Mitch taking the time to come on here and share his, uh, his, his journey and his talent and his wisdom with us. So thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Leo. Uh, I'll, I'll see how we do on the wisdom today. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So Mitch, um, there's, there's so much I wanna talk about, but to, to start with, we gotta start somewhere. And to start with, um, I'd like to kind of uh, know where you, know, you're, where you, where you came from. <laughs> I know this sounds funny to say, but, but you know, where you were from originally, where you were born and how, uh, how over the course of your life, you're so passionate and involved and the progression of the different types of arts and everything that you've done up to this point. You know, give us a sense of for a lot of people that have not seen your art, but also people like me who have some idea have seen it, but don't know any of the background about, about you specifically. Okay. I was born way up north in Newport Beach, California. <laughs> um, my parents lived in Corona Del Mar at the time. Um, they bought the house where I grew up here in Laguna when I was nine months old. So I've pretty much virtually grown up my whole life in Laguna and have lived here my whole life and went through the school system. Um, my, well, I've always wondered if I hadn't grown up in Laguna, if I'd grown up somewhere else, would I have been an artist and now a photographer? Um, you know, we're obviously all shaped by our environments, uh, our parents, our relationships, our friendships. Um, but because Laguna is an art colony and has such an incredible rich art history, I, I've always wondered, um, you know, because to, to, I believe to truly be an artist, so much of your artistic abilities is innate. It's, it's within you. Sure, you take classes, you learn, you develop, but, but there are people that work so hard at becoming an artist and just for whatever reason, just don't have it, can't do it. So, so there's, there's part of it that's within me. And I wonder if maybe if I'd been born and raised somewhere else, would that have eventually developed? Um, who knows? But I, I think obviously growing up in Laguna had a huge, huge impact on influencing me consciously and subconsciously and going to the direction of art. And my art interest throughout school was always there, but I found myself the beginning of my senior year in high school um, with all my requirements out of the way, could take plenty of electives, knew I was going to first start at um, Orange Coast College and then transfer someplace, but I had absolutely no idea what a major might be. And so there I found myself the beginning of my, my high school, senior high school year, and I thought, well, I've always loved to draw, so I'll, I'll take a drawing class. Um, um, and before I go a little bit further, I have to show you, we, we all start someplace. <laughs> this is my parents saved this. This is, I probably did this when I was four years old. Wow. So as, as, as I progress through my work, um, keep this in mind. So for those that, that, that work at art and, and feel they struggle, um, there's always hope. Um, <laughs> um, so my senior year of high school, I decided to take a drawing class. And um, the head of the art department uh, was Hal Akins, who happened to be a longtime friend of my parents. He and his wife literally had watched me grow up because over the years they would come over for dinners or we would go over to their place for dinner. And so for a, a learning situation experience, it was very comfortable. I was, I was very, um, very secure with him. I loved his artwork. We actually had several of his pieces in my living room. And I remember the beginning of the, the semester, I sat down and I started a pencil drawing. And I remember at, at the end of the week's worth of classes, I'd finished it and, and thought it was at that point the best drawing I'd ever done. And I took it up to Mr. Aikens with, uh, it's a pencil drawing with a, a source photo. And he had this amazing way to analyze and, and break things down to explain them. And especially with the source photo there, he could say, see what's happening here in the photo. And I'll look at your drawing. And he sent me back and forth between his desk and my desk over a second week's worth of classes to continue pushing and working the drawing and improving it. And I went from the first week thinking that's the best drawing I could do to the end of the second week, telling myself, I can't believe I've done this drawing and this is what I wanna do. So where I think a lot of high school seniors have 
some doubts or wonder um, what my major might be, what do I want to focus on, what do I want to do. I knew from a very early point exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into to art and illustration. And this actually is that first pencil drawing. Wow. If you can see it. Now, yeah. of course, um, I, I just dug this out. This has been tucked away in my closet in a portfolio that I haven't seen for years. Um, it's on horrible newsprint, which fades in yellows, um, not, not high quality paper at all. Um, but to go back and, and see this and realize how much this one drawing inspired my path. Um, and then yet I look at it now and it, it, to me, the, the quality and the ability just obviously wasn't yet there, but um, that, was, that was how I started. And I went to Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa. I studied commercial art and um, then moved on to Long Beach State, which has a, an incredible illustration department and began focusing on illustration. It was there at, at um, Long Beach State where I started diving into watercolors and that opened up a whole new world to me. And for about 24 years, I was primarily a, a watercolor um, illustrator um, with a little bit of graphic, graphic design um, on the side. So, wow, um, I had ne I'd never known that because I've always known you as a you know, photographer um, and I've, I've, known, uh, I've known of you for um, probably two and a half, three years or so, but we, I finally had a chance to meet you at the uh, Pageant of the Masters. Um, Last summer. At, at, yeah, and um, uh, Festival of Arts is, is exactly not the pageant itself, but Festival of Arts where, where you had a booth there and uh, were able to, you know, meet you in person. But what, a, what an incredible um, journey it's been because it's really a life of art, isn't it? You know, um, and always... Uh, practicing and thinking, you know, about um, art and watercolor and looking at the world differently. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll confess, I have not seen your watercolors. And um, so, but uh, I don't want to detract from, um, from my earlier question, you know, with, with your life and journey. So from there, um, at which point did you start going into more the digital and the uh, graphics and photography kind of uh, realm, which is kind of more where you are now, right? Right. Well, going back to high school, I started lifeguarding um, and I lifeguarded for 38 years for the city of Laguna Beach. So I was lifeguarding spring, summer, and fall. Uh, and that's typically the, the lifeguard season. I was at, at, at one point for a year, for a few years, uh, working part time throughout the winter also. Um, but going to school, um, studying illustration, becoming an illustrator. Um, I was an illustrator for 24 years. And when you get the chance to see some of my paintings, um, very tight, very detailed. Um, I would work with transparent watercolors, but they looked more like photographs. And it wasn't unusual for a single painting to sometimes take two or three months to complete. And after 24 years of that, I, I hit a wall. I really got to the point where I burned out. And, um, you know, wh whatever work you do, but especially if it's artistic, if you're to the point where you're burning out and it's becoming work and you're losing your passion and your drive for it, um, it I knew it was time to make a change. Um, my last really complete year of, of painting was 2008. And it was about the time that digital photography and the equipment for digital photography was really starting to prove and take off. And I had been as a kind of hobbyist taking pictures since I was 10 years old, 10 years old when my dad bought me my first camera. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's a new direction. Um, I started researching uh, digital cameras and uh, bought a, a professional camera with three professional lenses and played around with it a little bit, but said um, to myself, to do this right, I, I should go back to school. I really need to go back to school. And that's exactly what I did. I went back and studied uh, digital photography and Photoshop. And I'd say probably within the first two and a half months of my first class, 
almost similar to my high school experience, a whole new world opened up to me and I said, this is what I wanna do. And so I've been working now as a fine art photographer, photojournalist for the last um, 10, almost 11 years now. Okay. Um, now I always wondered, um, you know, I always, I always wanted to be an artist, but I was never good at anything. <laughs> so I dabbled in a little things here and there, never really, you know, uh, painted or, I mean, I did some drawings when I was very, very young, but never really pursued it to any kind of degree, but you did it for, you know, decades. And um, what is, what is, how is it, like, give me some sense for somebody who um, has never been in that world, how making a living has been for you being an artist and more specifically being an artist in, in Laguna Beach. Do you make a good living? Do you make a decent living? You were just making it? How, how, how did you do? Well, I, to me, working in art is for me passion. And um, there were times where I took some jobs within the art field that squashed my passion. Um, they maybe tended to be a little mechanical, uh, not as creative as I would have liked, a little restraining. And, but sometimes we all have to do that, especially as an artist. Um, it's a very competitive field. Um, to be unique and stand out from a crowd is um, always a challenge. And um, I, I did a lot of different things. And sometimes they weren't necessarily things that I set out to do. They were opportunities that presented themselves to me. For instance, for almost 10 years, um, kind of my graphic design side that took me away from illustration was um, a good friend of mine at the time uh, handled the payroll for um, ASICS Athletics. Um, their US corporate office at the time was in Fountain Valley. And he said, he was aware of my work and he said, well, maybe I can get you an interview with the head of the apparel department. And I said, love that. And I did and ended up working as a, a freelance designer for them for almost 10 years. And um, sometimes that's what we do as artists. We, um, our, our paths branch and we, we split and we do different things, sometimes surprising ourselves. Um, but that always to me was part of the excitement of it and part of the challenge of it. And so for 10 years, um, I was designing uh, apparel graphics for um, the various lines of, of ASICs. And everybody knows ASICs as a running shoe, but um, they're one of the probably world leading shoes in, in uh, wrestling, collegiate wrestling. Um, they're huge in volleyball, track and field, um, on and on and on. And so I, I found myself bouncing around through different sports and different graphics for different sports. Um, designing mostly t-shirt graphics, um, uh, collegiate uh, team jerseys. Um, for a couple years of those 10 years, ASICS was, and this was even before I started running, uh, was the major corporate sponsor for the New York City Marathon. And so I was designing the souvenir apparel line for the New York City Marathon. So it was a combination of shirts, running shorts, running jackets, caps, um, and everything coordinating together and um, quite fun and exciting. Um, at one point, I thought I was gonna get a chance to um, be able to design the wrestling, wrestling singlet uniform, uh, team uniform for the, would have been the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen, that didn't come to be, um, but enjoyed, enjoyed that for 10 years. Um, now it was the corporate experience and um, it's, um, I had some issues with um, one manager at one time who I found out after she left had been taking credit for my designs and presenting them as hers. Um, she was uh, difficult to work with, but um, the experience was incredible. I loved it. Yeah, and so now, now after you, uh telling me about that, I, I'm just thinking back about like, oh, so that's where some of the sports influence that kind of go into your work 
you know, a little bit here and there, right? Well, I've got a big auto racing background and that was because my dad in the 50s and 60s um, worked sports car club races uh, throughout Southern California. He was a what's called a corner worker. Uh, the, the people that are dressed in white with the warning flags out in the corner to warn drivers if there's an accident around a, a blind corner. And so my dad at an early age began taking me to races. Um, probably in my illustration career, one of the biggest influences I had was Road and Track Magazine. Road and Track Mag, my dad subscribed to Road and Track Magazine. So it was there every month, um, especially in the 60s and 70s. The magazine was almost 50 50, uh, 50 percent photography, 50 percent artwork. And they had some of the best automotive illustrators in the world. And this magazine was based just up in Newport Beach. Uh, my mom in the very early 60s, um, just before I was born, was actually a receptionist at Road and Track magazine for a couple of years. Um, through that experience, my parents became very good friends with the art director of the magazine. And so I had one of those amazing experiences where I, I grew up with this magazine and being heavily influenced by the artwork in it to the point where I think it was the early 90s, I found myself standing in the art department of Road and Track magazine with the now ex art um, director, my parents' friend, and the new art director with a couple of my pieces. And, and they were both admiring my work. And to the point where the, the current art director said, we'd like to keep um, your work on file and use it in the magazine. And, and within a couple of years, I had two pieces published in Road and Track magazine. So it was an interesting circle being influenced by the work within the magazine throughout my whole life, and then actually being in the magazine. Um, incredible. Yeah, that's, that's so amazing. I remember, you know, Road and Track all throughout my life, you know, seeing the magazine, whenever we would go to this bookstore, we look at the rack, and, you know, we always gravitate toward, you know, some of those uh, uh, road and track magazine cars and, you know, th things like that. So I remember vividly and, and to know that you, you had uh, some connection there is, is wonderful to hear. Um, another, good, another good family friend um, also worked for Dan Gurney, very famous American driver mm -hmm. after retired, uh, was a team owner and was designing and, and developing race cars, uh, mostly for Indianapolis 500. And um, so growing up, um, my parents' friend would, I was always bringing autographed pictures of the various drivers or posters and decals. And uh, so you, racing, yeah, has been a, a big influence on my, my artistic career, at least early. Okay. Um, so real quick, I see a bunch of people here um, on the okay. stream. Um, welcome. If you guys are watching, I'm with uh, Mitch Ritter. He's a um, local artists here in um, Laguna Beach. Or, uh, we're just talking about all the gamuts of things he's done over the years and some very interesting um, weaves and turns uh, into just an incredible amount of different types of disciplines that have been kind of converging you know, to the person that you see in front of you. So if you guys have any questions, um, go ahead and put it in the comments as you sit back and watch if anything comes to mind. Um, Otherwise, um, if you are watching uh, live right now, um, please uh, let us know that you're here and say hello. Let us know that uh, you're watching live. And for those of you who are watching on the replay, uh, if you could put down in the comments replay so we can uh, see that you've been watching. Um, so let's continue. Um, we've got so much to cover. Um, Mitch, um, I know you've got some um, art and things like that to show everybody. So let's just get right to it, right? Okay. Um, so I want to go ahead and show, show, show your screen, show your screen, and let's uh, tell some stories about these and uh, what went into these. Can you see this piece? I can, I can, you're good. This is Michael Andretti, son of very famous Mario Andretti, um, a watercolor painting, um, also appeared in Road and Track magazine. Um, one of my earlier pieces, um, I, my, my watercolors are very untraditional. I, I work in a way similar that maybe airbrush artists work where I used to 
work small sections of the painting at a time where the more traditional way to work a painting is, is put down kind of a, a light wash for a background and then slowly build it up. I would build my paintings more, more like um, as if you're constructing or putting together a puzzle. And, and I would mask off areas and that was how I was controlling the watercolor from spreading and bleeding into areas I did not want it to. And, and then building up with multiple layers to get the saturation and the intensity because most people tend to think of watercolors as, as just that washes, very soft, muted. Um, I always liked bold, intense colors, a lot of contrast between highlights and shadows. Um, for me, cropping and composition is also a, a very important part. And um, so this is uh, Emerson Fittipaldi, was originally a Formula One World Championship uh, champion and then uh, left Formula One and came to uh, IndyCars and raced um, IndyCars for several years. Again, a lot of tight, a lot of detail. It's almost hard to believe that that's a watercolor because it's like you said, it's not, it's not your typical traditional um, uh, subject matter as well as um, the techniques and and the, the, the inner workings of how this, it's almost like a cartoon drawing because it's so uh, detailed. Well, it, 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 you say it, it's, it doesn't look like a watercolor. Ironically, people used to mistake my watercolors for photography. And now that I'm a photographer and at the Festival of Arts, I print my photography on canvas. People now are asking, are my photos paintings? <laughs> So it's like, I, I can't win either way. <laughs> well, that's a, it's a good compliment, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. This is a, a photograph I shot in Dublin, Ireland. I was over in Dublin to, to uh, coach a team of, of uh, marathon runners and um, shot this uh, door in Dublin. Venice, Italy. Um, interesting story behind this. Um, this is actually painted from a friend's photo. Um, he and his wife had gone over to Italy. He came back, shared his photos with me. I love the reflections in the water. And I said, Ed, can I borrow your photo and do a painting of it? And he said, sure. And um, this is kind of near the end of my, my period of painting. And, um, but a few years later, I actually found myself um, in Venice, Italy. And, and at this point, I'd become a photographer and I was wandering around with my camera. And I climbed up this little bridge over a, a canal to, to take a picture. I'm looking through the, the viewfinder of my camera and all of a sudden things start to look familiar. And I found myself standing in this exact spot where he had taken the picture maybe eight years earlier that I had painted this from. Um, that's the, the small world. You never know what you're gonna run into, what you're gonna see. That's, that's so amazing. I mean, like there's millions of places, little millions of, nooks and crannies all over, you know, Italy and, and Venice. And um, you found yourself at the exact spot and being able to recognize that. Yeah, yeah. Buzz Aldrin on the moon, probably the most famous photograph shot, or one of the most famous photographs shot in this century. It was also used on the cover of Life magazine. And, and so this was a, kind of a stepping off point for me. I, I, as I do with my photography now with my painting, I often would look at, at how can I challenge myself? For instance, how can I take this original photo, one of the most well-known photos in the world and give it a new twist? And I've always been, whether back when I painted or now as a photographer, really attracted by reflections especially when painting, the challenge of painting a reflection. And so I wanted the helmet visor and the reflection into the gold-plated helmet visor to really be the focus part of the, the painting. Um, and I decided, well, I'll come with this really tight crop. The original photo, Buzz Aldrin was completely surrounded by the moonscape and you could see a little bit of his shadow because he's backlit. So I thought I'll pull in really tight, really close focus on detail, focus on um, reflections, and uh, this was the result. 
amazing. And it's, it's got this realism, you know, that you're able to put in that little, you know, you can tell it's not a photograph, but then you can't tell exactly what it is because that, that little badge with the names that looks so real, the realism is amazing. Thank you. And then this here is what's called an artist proof. I went ahead and made a limited edition prints of the actual painting. This is small, uh, artist proofs are typically small. The painting was probably three times this size. And this is actually signed by Buzz Aldrin. Wow. He always signs in blue Sharpies. So that's a, a telltale sign. You can tell if it's authentic. It's, if it's in blue <laughs> Sharpie, it's, it's Buzz. Yeah, great. Uh, from this concept of cropping and, and showing tight detail, um, my next series that I did was moving into animals, primarily African animals. And I thought, oh, same thing, how can I show an animal in a new and slightly different way? Um, animals are very popular for subject matter, whether it's painting or photography. Uh, typically, more often than not, you're seeing the animal within its entire surrounding. And I thought, like I showed the detail in this, the way to really show detail and beauty in an animal is to get up close. And so I used the same, uh, the same idea as with Buzz Aldrin is do a tight crop and allow one eye of the animal to, uh, to, to focus on for, for point of uh, attention. Gorgeous. Now this one I hadn't seen before is the cheetah. I, I don't even know how you do make the hair look so perfect. Very small brushes. <laughs> A lot of patience, very small brushes. <laughs> like you said, like some of the uh, like airbrush uh, artwork can be very detailed like that too. So yeah. It can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that that's kind of, the highlight of, of my illustration, a series of animals I did were, were very well um, received, uh, was published and featured in many magazines with the animals, uh, won in uh, international animal art competition two years in a row, um, had a couple of my images uh, published as fine art posters by a large publisher back in New York. And, um, but it was about the, the time it was, 24 years or so of, of illustration that I uh, started to burn out and then moved to photography. So um, with these, um, I'm looking at the, the animal um, uh, watercolor here. So you paint them and then you, you, did you make any reproductions of them or how does your kind of like post process, what, what, do, you, what do you do? Yeah, I, especially the animal series because they were so time intensive and really some of my favorite pieces and very popular. I, I did sell all of the originals um, and I would typically then, yes, create limited edition prints. Um, and as an artist, um, some of these paintings almost become like kids. We get attached to them <laughs> and, and uh, Having a, a limited edition print, um, I would print my prints also on watercolor paper at the same 100% size of the, the original. Um, so I never felt too bad about selling and letting an original go because I knew if it was something I really wanted to have on my own wall, I could always put a print up, which I often did. And then you, you sell the original? Yes, okay. as well as prints of the original. Cool. Good. Uh, it's good for the rest of us to know we can still get these prints if we wanted them. Yes, yes, they are available. Um, the animals range in, uh, they're all pretty much, uh, I'd say about 12, 13 inches wide by 24 to 28 inches high. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I, as I was burning out, it was, it was, time to make a switch. And that's when I went back to school and uh, studied uh, photography. 
great. Now we can uh, see some real photographs. Uh, I'm real. <laughs> <laughs> because well, uh, the good thing with, with photography is the variety. I absolutely love variety. And one of the things I love to do is travel. And very few things go together as well as travel and photography. And so this is uh, Rome uh, just before sunrise. Tuscany. Well, I love the perspective you have on everything that you do. It's always uh, very unique. Well, one of the things that was very actually almost effortless for me was the transition from painting to photography because they share so many of the same uh, qualities and so many of the, the same rules, whether it's the rules of composition, rules of lighting. Um, and, and I think that's really what's helped me so much in my photography is to have that strong base of, of art school and then 24 years of both illustration and graphic design um, have, have heavily influenced me in my photography, um, almost to the extent that when I'm out shooting pictures, um, sometimes I'm analyzing and I'm, I'm getting technical and I'm thinking about what I need to, to produce the shot that I, I want to get. But so much of what I do, especially now in photography is very intuitive. Um, one of the things I started back um, when I began painting and illustration, and I still use it to this day, was every time I see an image, whether it's on television, in a book, in a magazine, um, in the movies, um, driving down the freeway on a billboard, if I see an image and it literally makes me say, wow, out loud, because it's, it's that dynamic, um, I started, I, and it wasn't anything a teacher taught me, it was just something that I developed for myself um, to get in the habit of every time something made me stop and say, wow, then I'd ask myself, okay, what about this image is, is so different that it's giving me that kind of an impact. What, what is making it stand out above all other uh, images? And I did this year after year after year to eventually, I kept this list in my head of what I liked, what um, gave an image uh, or a painting drama. Um, lighting is, is huge. The, the, Lighting sets the mood, it, it brings out texture and contrast and um, composition is huge, uh, subjects are huge. Um, um, I like to, since both painting and photography are displayed in a two-dimensional format, but they're representing a three-dimensional form, it came uh, to be very important to learn, okay, how do I show depth? in a flat painting? How do I show depth in a flat photograph? And for me, that was about layering, thinking about um, parts of the image in the foreground, parts of the image in the middle ground, parts of the image in the background, and how they worked and how images in the foreground partially hide images in the middle ground and background. That gives you the depth because when something is covered, you know it's farther back. When something's more prominent than up front, that gives you, uh, you know, more depth in an image. And so starting to think about spatial concepts um, three-dimensionally, but in a two-dimensional form um, became very, very important. And so I had all of that experience when I started to move um, into photography. Um, back in 2015, I took a trip to Cuba. Um, one of the most fascinating places I've traveled to. I, 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 a lot of people could say, well, I, I've not traveled as much as I would like, and that's definitely the case with me. Um, if I had my dream job, it would be traveling the world with my camera and, and photo documenting for, for somebody or, or myself. Um, but went to Cuba in 2015, about a year after um, travel restrictions had been opened. And with the goal of wanting to go down and photo document things before they began to shift and change too much. Um, of course, travel's been, for the most part, fairly shut down now due to the current president. Um, but I believe the 
precedent to follow will again reopen um, uh, negotiations with Cuba. And um, I, I really hope for their sake that the trade embargo is dropped. And, um, but yeah, just uh, a fascinating place from culture to music, to architecture, all of the old American cars, the food, um, the rum's incredible, <laughs> um, everything about it. Uh, the only thing I, I didn't like, and, and it was just one of those things was I had more rain than I would have liked in the week that I was there, um, but went out and shot anyway. Beautiful, yeah, um, I, I agree with the, with, the, with the travel and stuff like that. You would be like, if there was any ever an uh, advocate for uh, somebody to travel, like you would be the person, like I would just send you out so that I could see these beautiful photographs that you would bring back, you know? Well, let's, let's go about that. Anybody out there who needs a travel photographer, um, someone who um, enjoys cultures and the differences in cultures, um, who, someone who likes to explore um, and, and document. Um, you know, I, I've, again, weaved careers together here where um, I, I found myself um, interviewed for a news story um, this was back while I was still lifeguarding. This was about um, 11 years ago. And um, I had an unfortunate accident of a scuba diver um, drowning, dying on my beach. He'd had an aneurysm. And um, so the story was on uh, the diver accident and, and myself. And the reporter, writer, and photographer that came down to interview me for the story, um, he and I became friends. And it so turned out that he left the paper a few weeks later and gave me a heads up that he was leaving. And he said, Mitch, have you ever thought about being a photojournalist? And I said, no, <laughs> but I, I like the idea. And so he put me in touch with the, uh, the editor and um, much like my job with um, ASICs and the graphic design, sometimes it's, things come about by contacts and who you know, and it leads you in a whole new direction. And um, so I, I then became a photojournalist and it was a little bit of a, a battle in a, in a good way, in an artistic way with my editor because she was very traditional um, journalist. She wasn't, she wasn't a photographer herself, but as an editor obviously knows what a, um, uh, newspaper photo is supposed to look like. And I was coming more from a fine art background. And um, I think I kind of retrained her eye um, because a sense of place, especially in a newspaper photo, you usually um, have only one shot to tell a story unless it's a photo feature and then you have multiple photos. Um, and, and I love the challenge of, of telling a story with one photo. You know, the writer would interview the person and gets, you know, multiple paragraphs or a couple pages sometimes to develop a story and give background. And I don't get that opportunity. I get one chance usually um, for, for the story for the photo. And um, so I began bringing my artistic eye to the traditional form of uh, photojournalism. And once my editor kind of started to see what I was doing and how I was doing it, she said, oh, okay. And kind of like a light came on for her. And, but it was kind of a meeting in halfway because um, uh, sometimes I would have to incorporate, you know, obviously what she would need for the assignment and, and to match obviously what's going with the story and what the writer needs. Um, but they are very interesting, the kind of mixture of, of fine art with more of a traditional medium of uh, journalism. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an amazing story. Um, I, I think um, it, just, it just goes to show like, you know, this is how you get along with people. You, 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 you have to kind of not convince, but you to show what, what, what it is that the story that you're trying to tell as a photographer, and she's trying to show a story she can tell as a as a journalist, you know, and so uh, you 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 um, explained that perfectly with about how you kind of just worked with her, and um, so there's some uh, give and take in there, and then and ultimately 
she was able to see your side of the story and be able to show your photos in a proper way. Right. Uh, this was, I shoot obviously for the Laguna Beach Independent, is a weekly newspaper here in Laguna. Uh, this assignment was the, the city was looking at uh, safety issues with Laguna Canyon Road and how can it um, incorporate safety features not only for drivers but for cyclists for any people walking or running uh, on the bike path or bike shoulder. And um, so I set myself up on a weekend morning when I'm aware being an ex runner and being out on weekends, I know that the bike clubs like to um, descend on Laguna, um, whether it's Coast Highway or Laguna Canyon on the weekends. So I perched on the side of the hill, um, right off side of uh, Laguna Canyon and then waited. And, um, and that's, uh, been a, 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 I think, a very valuable quality both in my painting and photography's patience <laughs> is um, yeah. waiting for that that right moment, the the right the right time. And that's a perfect depiction of of, of uh, what the canyon is like with the cyclists and stuff. So that's a really great picture. Uh, another thing that photojournalism has brought me is is the shooting of events. Uh, this is from Hospitality Night, if, if those in Laguna are familiar with Laguna know. The first Friday in December every year is hospital Hospitality Night, where they close the downtown streets, the shops are open, they have live music, food, uh, the local church has um, sometimes a bell choir, um, just a whole bunch of things going on, and the big event is Santa arrives on the uh, uh, vintage fire engine. Yeah, we, we love hospitality nights with music and food and, you know, all the locals are out, everybody's seen. It's very, it's a very community uh, driven uh, event. And so it's great. So that's a little bit of my photojournalism. Yeah, uh, this is all really um, great. And uh, whatever you want to show us, um, if you don't mind, um, just I know that there's so much um, because of everybody's got a cell phone and everybody's taking pictures and every day I see crappy pictures and things that don't make any sense and it's blurry, it's out of focus, it's, you know, a million different ways. So I think, I, I think just at least for me, I, I'm thinking like if you go through these photos and just uh, point out a couple of things like, you know, what maybe one or two things that, that, that make this photo um, valuable and why and kind of like what your thoughts and thinking it. So, and kind of just gives a couple of pointers for each maybe that people maybe may not recognize and may not be able to appreciate. Well, one of the things that I think the everyday person with a cell phone or camera who's doesn't really consider them a photographer, but would like to think they maybe are, um, I think what, what, what sets the regular person with a, a cell phone apart from a photographer is uniqueness. Um, I think one of, the, one of the problems people have with, with taking pictures is, um, especially if it comes to a familiar um, landmark or a well-known site, um, is, is always taking pictures from a similar angle where you can say, well, I've seen that picture or something like it a million times. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's trying to go a step further for me as a professional photographer. And, and, and that's the challenge is taking something that is so familiar and trying to show it in a new and different way. Um, good example of that is here, the Queen Mary. Um, I shot this just at sunrise, literally the first rays of light coming up as the sun was coming up over the horizon. Um, don't tell anybody, but sometimes photographers do things and go places they're not supposed to do to get shots. Yeah, um, you know, you know, uh, hold on a second. You know, so um, I know you showed one other, um, I think it was photo or even a something where you where you were up early in the morning and so you got to be a, you got to be an early person to be like a, a serious photographer you got to be able to get up early 
Well, um, going back to the everyday photographer, um, I would say we tend to see many more sunsets than we do sunrises because people are up for sunset, but not, not as many people are up for sunrise. So yeah, I, I do what I need to do to get a different or unique type of shot. And often that means um, getting up before sunrise because you know for Long Beach, it's, it's the drive time. I have to get up and get up there and, and then get into my location on time so I'm not rushed. Um, to get this shot, um, this is actually from the uh, rock jetty that surrounds the hull of the Queen Mary, um, usually separated by a fence. Um, there was a large hole in the fence, and so I creep through the fence and um, walked out over these huge jetty boulders, got into position, and then waited for, for the light. Um, Another, let me see, another, another example of, of that, especially for people in Laguna. Um, famous, famous landmarks. Um, probably the two largest or best known landmarks in Laguna are the Hotel Laguna and the Lifeguard Tower. We've all seen both if you live locally a hundred million times. Um, and, and typically it's that cliche postcard shot that you see from the same angle. So for me, the challenge was, how do I show the Hotel Laguna from a new and different angle um, that actually gives it a different sense of place with the coastline? And so it's, it's experimenting, it's exploring, it's um, traveling a lot of little um, neighborhood streets and looking from the hillside just for that right angle and then catching it just at the right time with the right light. Um, actually this night as I shot this, it was actually a storm rolling in off the ocean and it was actually starting to just sprinkle lightly. Um, but I think it was also that storm that helped give it this moodiness as, as it was just starting to get dark. Yeah, I'll just tell you real quick um, what I see here from this photo just from my own eyes. So typically, um, you know, a, a, an amateur photographer or cell phone taker, even if they were at the same spot, they would probably get the, get a uh, get the photo of the Hotel Laguna, and maybe an ex, as an extension, they might have that first code in the frame. Um, what you've done here, you've stacked you stacked all the codes, you know, together to give that depth that that we were talking about earlier. Right. And what's foreground, amazing? Foreground, yeah. middle ground, background. Yeah. And what's amazing, you can see so much in here just because I've spent so much time in all of these coves and also paddleboarded out to the bird rocks, the two rocks that you see in the uh, kind That's of- That's seal rock. Bird rock is just okay. off, off of uh, Main Beach here. Seal rock, seal rock, okay. That's right, I always get them mixed up. So seal rock there. And um, this, is not a, this is not a perspective, a, a, a frame that you would normally ever see for so many reasons. You know, and so, um, uh, and you can see the little, uh, I don't know if you call it a, a Christmas tree light that's always lit there um, by the flag. Um, oh, that's and, um, the monument, yeah. for monument point there. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, there's just a lot in this photograph. And um, so it's, it's super amazing. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, another famous landmark, um, again, just trying to show it in a slightly different way, really, having almost the clouds, the clouds in the sky dominate as opposed to the lifeguard tower itself. Um, but again, the challenge is how can I show something that everybody has seen? You know, it's, it's said that within a year, uh, Laguna receives almost, what, 6 million, 6.5 million visitors in a normal year. It's not gonna be this year, it's this year. So how many millions and millions of people have seen this on the boardwalk, but then to see it from the inside, yeah. Only a select few have ever seen the lifeguard tower from inside. I, I have never seen it. I've only seen it from the doorway looking into <laughs> inside. Right. Yeah, this is upstairs. This is the observation deck. This is where, where we would lifeguard from. Pageant of the Masters. Again, um, trying to find a different unique angle. Beautiful. I am uh, friends with the, the pageant director from all my years of being in the festival. 
And uh, I asked if I could uh, shoot one of the final dress rehearsals. This is May of a couple years ago. And so there was no audience. So I was literally allowed to basically lay right on the stage, mm -hmm. just off the wings and be able to shoot this. Yeah, and this is a perspective that most people don't see at all. It doesn't matter how many times they've been to the pageant, they just don't get to see the depth you know, of what this, uh, right. this pageant piece is put together in this way. I know that, that the show do their best to try to show people that, hey, you know, this is how we set up the people. This is how they're um, uh, put together with the background and then the foreground with people and, and things like that. But this kind of puts it totally uh, in, in perspective, like, oh, now I see, you know, where people stand in, in the photo. And from this angle, you can actually see the stage lighting built within the frame of the piece, which it's those lights that help diminish the shadows of the volunteers, the models in the piece. So from the audience perspective, all you see is the frame. You can't see the, the lights behind the frame, but it's those lights that help flatten and reduce the shadows. I didn't even realize that they were they were still kind of older style lights or they have been like put in like LED strips around or something like that yet. Uh, they're, they're transitioning to that a little bit, but the show is so specific with their lighting and what they do. Um, and they've been doing it for so long and doing it so well for so long that uh, I, I think I think they hesitate to kind of mess with, with the, the formula. Yeah, definitely, because it would look a little different. Um, they would have to get the temperature exactly right and everything. Right. Now, a lot of these images are all going into, I'm working on my first book. It's a Laguna coffee table photo mm -hmm. book. And um, my idea behind the book was from the standpoint that it's hard to believe as, as well known as Laguna is, as artistic and, and with the artistic roots that Laguna has, Laguna does not have a go-to comprehensive a photo book, coffee table book. We, we have a lot of historical books with a lot of incredible vintage black and white, um, amazing photos of Laguna's history. Um, there have been a few books done uh, on Laguna as, as somewhat of a color coffee table book, but they really include more of those postcard cliche type shots and are really more for tourists and visitors. Um, my idea for this book really came from the perspective of almost designing a book for locals. Um, putting, putting a book together that was so cool that locals would want to have it on their coffee tables or bookshelves. But obviously because of the subject matter, um, visitors would like it too. So uh, through this book, I'm, I'm trying to really show as much of what Laguna has to offer from, from the beaches and the coves to the canyons, to the hilltops and the different neighborhoods, to um, interesting local hangouts, to the art and the public art, to the events, um, a little bit of everything. And um, back to the challenge of, of photography. Um, okay, here we have an alley. Um, we typically think of alleys as shortcuts, as uh, places uh, where deliveries are made, um, places where trash is picked up, um, and often where we discard things we, we no longer want. And, and so for me, the challenge throughout this book is even taking things like an alley that one would tend to think is unattractive. Um, and that's what we do as photographers, we, we take almost any kind of subject matter and under the right lighting and the right setting, um, making it a thing of interest. And now this is a sunset, right? Just after sunset, correct. Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I did not know that there was not a, a, a photo book of Laguna like, like you described. Um, and uh, I'll I'll be I'll be put I'll be putting my name in and getting in line to get that book. As soon <laughs> Thank as you. Um, I'm I'm almost finished shooting for the book um, until this uh, worldwide pandemic thing hit. 
Mm. And it's, you know, I, I, the last few things that I really wanted to shoot were interiors of businesses. And so I'm, I'm waiting to, for the, those to slowly come back. Um, I wanted to also include the Laguna Playhouse. I don't know if, if that's going to be opening anytime soon. I doubt it, but, um, but I, I'm just trying to show daily life um, within Laguna. I mean, this is a perfect example. And, and going back to my illustration, obviously, I was heavily, uh, um, heavily influenced by um, Norman Rockwell and his, his sense of place and, and culture and daily life. And, and, and this is the kind of stuff that I, I love to do. People just going about their thing, not knowing I'm there. It's ironic, all these people in the picture and the only person that knows I'm taking the picture is the dog. Yeah, I see that. I was just, I was just looking at that. But again, kind of very Norman Rockwell, just the inner reaction of the, the moms with their kids, Easter egg hunt at Laguna Beach High School, um, getting, getting low, I'm actually laying in the grass, so I'm getting the, the eggs in the foreground. And um, I just, I love, again, the foreground, middle ground, background thing and try to bring people into the, the, the picture and, and almost give them the impression as if they're, they're there lying in the grass um, watching this unfold. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Um, you, you mentioned because of COVID and stuff like that. Um, now, of course, the downside is that you're not seeing the, the normal everyday life that you would like to shoot. Um, has, has, has there been any advantages? Have you been shooting while things were shut down? Um, can you give us a sense like what, what you've been going through just in more recent times? Unfortunately, I haven't been doing much shooting. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, currently working for the paper due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I have on occasions gone out, I uh, went out the first week or two of the shutdown and, and took some pictures of downtown Laguna, what would have normally been rush hour traffic with empty streets. Um, I was shooting just the other night around the corner from me is Cafe 242 uh, Sushi. And just as I was walking downtown and walking past the restaurant, a uh, drive up um, pickup uh, customer was um, waiting for food. So I got a great shot of uh, an anonymous arm handing out a bag of food through the window as the guy was standing on the curb with his mask and, and putting his wallet away and grabbing the bag. Um, so there is a little bit of that. Um, I, I, I really haven't, I guess I've kind of been taking a little bit of a break um, mm -hmm. and using it as downtime and um, really haven't been shooting as much as I, I really should or, or would like to. Um, and I, I think that's important I because I, I, I go full bore, um, you know, whether it's I'm, I'm up for sunrise um, I mean, not too long ago, I was out uh, shooting Barber's Lake, one of the three natural lakes um, at the eastern end of Laguna Canyon, and wanted to get one of those shots with mist on the lake just as the sun's breaking the horizon. Um, and so, you know, that's getting up early, getting out there hiking in the dark, getting in position and um, doing that. But uh, so I've done a little bit, but not as much as I I typically would when things are open and going full bore. Cool, cool. I, I love that lake. I drive by it all the time, and I there's some days you're just extremely mystical over there. So yeah. um, I, I can see why you wanted to get out there and, and get that shot there. This is the glass booth at the Sawdust Festival. I was able to get inside the the glass blowing booth and um, watch the glass blowers working. And and again, it's got that Norman Rockwell feel to it with all the, the expressions of the people watching and, and staring and uh, leaning to get a better look or pointing. And uh, I, I just love that inner reaction and catching it. I don't know how you get people not to look at you wherever I am with a, with a camera. <laughs> there, there's always at least one or two like just looking at me like, what, what you're taking a picture of me. I don't know how you well, sometimes, sometimes that happens, but glass blowing, especially most people that watch glass blowing at the sawdust have never seen it in person. So when it's literally, because they're just probably 16 inches away, they've just got the glass between them and the, the glass blower. And, and to be that close and to see and watch is, 
they're riveted and they're, yeah, they're, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm in the background, I'm shooting with a bigger lens and trying to be kind of as, as invisible as possible, which is the way I like to shoot. I like when I'm out shooting, I like to try to be invisible and catch things as they're happening. Um, obviously with my lifeguard background, um, I was able to uh, be a part of a uh, lifeguard training academy. These are um, uh, future lifeguards in the lifeguard academy training uh, in the area called the Giggle Crack, which is just north of Divers Cove and practicing rock rescues and working with surge of, of waves in and out and how you deal with a victim or a, a, a person you're trying to to rescue and, and precautions you have to take as a first responder um, to keep yourself safe. Um, and so they're working uh, the uh, giggle crack. Yeah, and Laguna is so unique and um, which is part of its geology of having so many of these rocky kind of rocky shores in combination with beaches, uh, with sand and things like that. And so these lifeguards are have to be you know, pretty well trained. Um, and I've never seen anything like this before. I've seen them down in South Laguna jumping in, kind of similar to the scene right here. But uh, but the lifeguards, they got their work cut out for them because there's always people climbing on rocks and right. accidents happen. And, and these are the situations they, they run into. You know, it's, it's not unheard of, you know, from a day-to-day -day basis. All the time, yeah. Do we have any questions? Anybody interested in anything, like to know anything? Um, well, we haven't had any questions yet, but I see some people on. And if you guys are watching and you guys have any questions, I know if you're like me, like I'm just riveted, like I'm just staring at these photos and just taking so much of it in. Um, but if you guys have any questions, um, no questions about cell phones, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I rarely shoot with my cell phone camera. Um, one, because if I do get a good shot, I'll know I'll be frustrated and disappointed because the lens quality is not what my professional camera has and I won't be able to, uh, uh, for the most part, blow it up and use it like I would like to. Um, and I, 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 I just, I don't, I don't see it as real photography and I use it occasionally if I don't have my camera with me and there's something, you know, I want to share with somebody, but um, it, it's funny as a photographer, it, it's, it's in my pocket and I, I almost, I rarely take it out and use it. Yeah, I, I was just thinking what you were saying that, um, you know, the difference is like, it's like having a camera, uh, having a camera with all the tools you need, such as a, a Swiss army or a survival, you know, Leatherman that's all um, been sharpened and has all the tools you need to survive and stuff like that. and a cell phone camera would be equivalent to like a butter knife compared to that. <laughs> yeah that's that's a good analogy that works <laughs> you know because you just can't do you just don't have the tools to, to do it it just it just it just it's just like a butter knife it's just dull it can only do one thing it can only cut butter you know and it can't do anything else Yeah, to, to me, lighting and photography is, is everything. If, if you're completely void of light, you obviously can't take a picture, but even with the smallest amount of light, even, even just starlight, you can capture with a camera. Um, and, and to me, um, the best times of day always to shoot are, are the, the dusk and dawn periods. Um, which are 25 minutes before sunrise or 25 minutes after sunset, where you get that really nice dusky blue sky. Um, and then just before, or just after sunrise and just before sunset, where you get this really nice gold, warm light. Um, it's just the best. Yeah. I, I... I was just trying to think about like your photos, um, like that last one with the cars at the, I, uh, that's at the, uh, so um, are you on a tripod here? Cause the light looks relatively low and you've got such a sharp image there. Yes, I, I, I 
as much as possible, if the circumstances allow, I'm shooting on a tripod and I was shooting on a tripod here. This obviously isn't a tripod. This is the Halloween celebration on Oak Street where Oak Street is closed to auto traffic and it's wild and crazy. And uh, I, I just, I love the expressions on the kids. Yeah. And these, these are the kind of things I like, um, I like seeing. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you're taking these kind of photos. And like you said, kind of like a uh, Norman Rockwell type with people, their everyday lives, you know, uh, these are normal happenings in Laguna. Um, so able to capture things like that, because I think most people don't see Laguna like this at all. They see, they see the, the lifeguard tower and, and on Main Beach, they walk the boardwalk, they have a little dinner or something like that, and they go home. You know, and you don't see so much of this, right? Right. Well, I, I have I have two two parts of of me. It's almost like I have dual personalities within photography. Um, there is one side of me that is uh, very calculating, and I strategize, and I pre-plan, and I I I research a shot. I research if it's a location I've never been to. I, I initially do a Google image search and find the interesting place. Um, then I use a, a, a Sun app that you can plug in the date and drop a pin on the subject that I'm photographing. And then there's a slider at the bottom of the screen that I slide. And as I slide it from left to right, it shows me the movement of the sun throughout the day. So it gives me the sun angle, which also then gives me the shadow angles. And so I then plan what time of day is ideal to shoot that location because, um, and, and di different time of year, the sun moves and is in different spots. Sometimes the year that location might be backlit most of the day and it won't be good for shooting. Um, and so I, I do all this pre-planning to get just the shot that I want, but then there's things like this which is more like street photography. And I'm, I'm literally creating on the go and catching things as I see them, as they're happening. And so it's an it's a, a interesting mix between analytically planning a shot to creating as something's happening with street photography. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, you know that, that really brings together the technical side as well as a more creative side and more spontaneous side you know of shooting you know this shot i wanted to to give the, the viewer the experience of what it's like sitting on one of laguna's trolleys and driving through town and and introduce motion by by using a slow shutter speed my camera is on a tripod and i'm seated and so everything that's moving is out of focus the cars and the buildings but the people are relatively still, so they're in focus, as well as the inside of the trolley. So Mitch, we have a question here real quick. Sure. Um, and it's from Pilar Christie. Um, she asked. Hi, Pilar. I, she said, um, after so many years as a painter, what do you think made you burn out? Uh, several things. It was the repetition. Um, to, to, to complete a painting, as I said, sometimes it would take upwards of two to three months. Um, to start a painting with a blank white piece of watercolor paper got to the point where it was a little intimidating because I knew how much work was ahead of me. And, and instead of diving in and being excited, um, I found myself starting to tighten up. I was more worried about making mistakes. Um, I wasn't working on a piece as long as I typically would. Sometimes I could only sit down maybe for 20 minutes to work, and then I'd be up doing something completely unrelated, where prior I would could work off and on all day and late into the night and be excited, and, and, and it was almost forcing myself to go to sleep. But as I got to the end of my painting career, it was just the opposite. And, and as I said, I think earlier, is anytime you're doing something that's creative, if it gets to the point where it's work, um, then it was time to make a change. And I, I think it was just painting uh, at this level with this type of detail 
um, with this uh, intensity for 24 years, I, it led me to burnout. And, and it's, not, it's not just the thing with the painting, because I find I'm, I'm a person who tends to do all sorts of things throughout my life for long periods of time. And then I get to the point where I burn out and I stop and I kind of reinvent myself and I switch and I move on to something. Um, I uh, was a competitive long distance runner for almost 28 years. I've run 50 marathons, 50 26.2 mile marathons. And I got to the point where I said, you know, this is a lot of work and I'm not enjoying it like I used to. And 50 is a nice round number to stop on. And, and so my last marathon, my 50th marathon was LA Marathon of 2014. And um, I really haven't run that much since. <laughs> I mean, a little bit for fun. I certainly haven't competed or, or done any of that. Um, but that's kind of kind of what I've done through my life. You know, I, I lifeguarded for the 38 years and, 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 and once I stopped, I, 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 I don't miss it. Um, it was once I stopped lifeguarding, I realized the constant layer of stress that was always on me um, while working because I was under the situation of knowing that something could happen at any moment, at any time. And um, of course, over so many years, I, you develop a, a ability to, to deal with that stress and accept that stress. But once I had, had stopped working and stepped away from it, I really became that much more aware of it. And to the point where I found myself driving down Coast Highway past Main Beach in, during the day, and I could see the lifeguard towers open, the lifeguards working, I'd say, Oh, I'm so glad I'm not working <laughs> just because of all the things we'd have to deal with and, and uh, battle with. But um, no, it was great. It was great while it lasted. So I hope, I hope Pilar, I hope I answered your question. Um, I've been now shooting as a photographer for 10 years and, and I still have, I think the same passion level that I did when I started. Um, I absolutely love what I do. Um, I challenge myself, whether it's occasionally still taking classes um, to push myself to learn new things, um, maybe do things that I wouldn't do or take the time to do on my own, um, and finding new and different things to, to shoot and research. Um, it's, it's constant fun. I, I just love it. Yeah, I can really, I can really see that, Mitch, just uh, through this conversation and then knowing a lot more about, you know, um, your your uh, journey up to this point and and i can see the the multiple um uh disciplines and skills and creativity all kind of come together for you in this medium it has and and as i said earlier it, it was really a seamless transition for me because there is so much that I borrow and use from my art background. Um, as I said, um, I've got these dueling sides that, that like to plan. Like for instance, these, this series of old gas stations and, and neon signs um, are disappearing quickly, um, whether through age and falling down and, and, and or um, being vandalized or sold and bought by collectors um, to research these locations, find where they are, hope they're still existing because um, this in particular is out near Barstow. So it's relatively close, but it's hard to find old things like this in California. So we have to travel a distance. You have to go into Nevada, into Utah, into Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma um, to find some of these things. And there've been cases where I've researched, got to the location and it's no longer there. <laughs> I, you know, I do my best to try to prevent that from happening, um, but sometimes that happens. That's like if you wanna take a sunrise and the sun stop can, didn't come up that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So.
any other questions? Uh, no, it looks like we're okay right now. Um, yeah, feel, feel free to share whatever else um, you like, Mitch. Um, I'm, we're, I'm just really enjoying it. We got a few people still on okay. here and I think they're feeling the same way. It's just whatever you um, are open to share, I think we're way over time, but you know, I think we're just all enjoying the, the art here. Okay, as I mentioned, sometimes us photographers uh, go places we're not supposed to go to get a, a new or unique shot. Um, this is the Sixth Street Bridge up in Los Angeles, just east of downtown LA. Um, it it's, uh, had been the second most popular film location in Los Angeles for the film industry, the first being uh, Griffith Park. Um, unfortunately, this bridge was torn down, um, I guess it's probably a, about three or four years ago. Uh, the concrete of the bridge had a alkali issue where portions of the concrete were literally turning to gel and it was causing the concrete to crack, exposing rebar, which was starting to rust. And uh, engineers were then predicting the bridge had well, a 75% chance of complete collapse in a, a large earthquake. So the bridge had to be destroyed and they're now in the process of rebuilding a new bridge, new version. But knowing that, that this famous landmark was going to be disappearing over a period of about three, four years, I was going up constantly at different times a day. This is before sunrise to photograph and document the bridge before it disappeared. And one day, this is before sunrise, I had the idea of climbing the span, one of the two steel spans, to take shots um, from the top of the span. And uh, my friend Carrie, uh, went up with me and she's taking the picture of me uh, beginning my climb up this arch. And then once I got to the top, this is what I saw just before sunrise. Mm. That's great. You're able to get a good view of that bridge on the other side. Yeah. So again, photography is, is trying to be inventive of, of think of, okay, how can I again, shoot something that's so familiar. And this has been, this bridge is, seen was seen in, in constant car commercials, um, movies, um, TV series, all sorts of, of things, both uh, uh, scenes shot on the bridge and below the bridge. And so again, it's, it's how can I show a, a, a famous worldwide known landmark in a new and different way? So, so Mitch, if I find something that's, that's going to get torn down or going to get Right up that has a lot of significance in history. I'll just call you, right? I'd love that. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, that's. Well, I think a lot of people are dying to, to, for, to, for you to show um, the photo that we used for the uh, Facebook um, story with all the medals and we can tell a little bit about it. Oh, okay. Um, responsibly trespassing for the love of art. That's exactly what it is, Pilar. <laughs> so can you see this now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a, a self-portrait I shot at a, in a photo class at uh, Saddleback College. It was a studio lighting class. And I'm, I'm trying to remember the assignment. Um, I think we had to, to depict uh, an accomplishment of some kind. And it was totally open, left to us. And this is... A, just after I think I had probably completed my last and final marathon. And so I thought, well, why not shoot myself wearing all 50 of my finishers medals? And, and that was one of the questions I got from people in the last couple of days before we came on was, what are those medals? Well, for those that don't run marathons, um, every official finisher of a marathon receives one of these medals. And um, so it's not unusual for say the New York City 
marathon, which I've run, or the Boston Marathon, which I've run, to have uh, 35,000 finisher medals. And so as you cross the finish line, you have a volunteer there that uh, slips the medal over your neck. Yeah, so, so you get the medal for finishing. Correct. Uh, not necessarily being a one, two, or three or something. Oh, no, I was never that, never that fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, you've ran more than 99% um, of people I know. Well, I, I also coached and trained marathon runners. I used to coach, I was the Orange County coach for the Le Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's team and training program uh, for several years. And at that time, marathon running was really becoming more of a popular sport for the general everyday person. But back then, only it was one half of 1% of the world's population had ever run a marathon. It's probably ticked up slightly, but yeah, a very small number of people um, run marathons. Well, great. Now, the, now we know the full story about that. So, um, I know that we could probably go um, all night here with your photos. As, you know, <laughs> I think you've, you've shot so much and you've always done such a great job and you take so much care with all the, all the photos that you do. And for those uh, who weren't on earlier, earlier or just watching this from a replay, you know, uh, Mitch is putting together, you know, a, a Laguna Beach photo book. What, what, do you have a title yet or that's still in the works? I, I do have a title. It's Laguna Through the Local Lens of Mitch Ritter. Okay, and so that's the book. Uh -huh. Go ahead. A little back, just a little bit more on the book. Um, I, I'm very fortunate that I have a world-renowned surfing photographer, surf and lifestyle photographer, who has already written a piece for the book. And I will also be having, uh, and I, and I can't reveal the name, I don't want to reveal the name yet, but I have an Academy Award winning actor that is also going to be writing the foreword for this book. Amazing! That's great. I'm very excited. Do you, do you have a uh, what's what's uh, your timeline for get uh, for um, uh, public release and stuff? Uh, no timeline. I was given very good advice by another photographer at the festival last summer who's done several books. And he said, "Mitch, this might be your first of several books, or this might be your one and only book." But he said, "Make it make it your book. Make it the be the book you want it to be," and. So I was on the verge of finishing shooting until the, the pandemic hit. So that slowed things down a little bit. Um, we've designed the front and back cover and we're just on the verge of starting to dive into the actual layout and design of the book itself. Uh, once we've done that, um, I have a local publisher, but I, I think we're gonna try to what's called co-publishing it, where um, through his publishing company, we'll approach a major publishing house and uh, have it published through them because they are the experts at uh, marketing, distribution, yeah. uh, sales, all of that. And I think, you know, why go through all this effort and this work and potential money to not have it done right? Yeah. And so I, I'm hoping to then turn it over and shop it to uh, large publishing houses. And back to answer your question, I'm not really sure because I don't know how long it will take to find uh, a house, a publishing house to, to pick it up. And once they have it, then it's on their time schedule. Right. So it could be sometime this year. It could be 2021 or 2022. Who knows, right? Hopefully sooner than, than later. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been uh, working on this specifically now for almost two years. Uh, shooting for it and like I said almost finished shooting and uh, excited but a little overwhelmed because they just, Laguna has so much to offer how do you fit that all in one book and 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 the hardest part of this project for me is still ahead it's determining what images make the book and which are left out yeah for sure and and to, to make the the biggest impact as well as what your vision is for the book so right. um, that's definitely Definitely a lot of the work there. So, okay, well, we'll, we'll be waiting in anticipation because uh, I know that uh, everybody who knows you would, would love, to, love to see the final piece of the book. So, um, 
Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to share? That's it. Okay. Um, I think so, we kept everybody long enough. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, and with uh, with good reasons because uh, these images are gorgeous. Um, so, as with uh, our tradition, um, tell everybody um, what you love about where you live. What don't I love? Um, <laughs> Laguna is an amazing place, and it's amazing how different it is, how different its character and atmosphere is from its two nearest neighbors, Corona del Mar to the north and Dana Point to the south. I, I love that uniqueness. Um, biased opinion, but because I'm an artist, I obviously love the art history and the art background and the art colony portion of Laguna's history and roots. Uh, obviously heavily influenced by the art festivals growing up and my parents taking me to the art festivals when I was young and receiving an art scholarship from both the Festival of Arts and Sawdust Festival when I graduated from Laguna Beach High School and um, influenced by all of the galleries and I you know love the the restaurants the eclectic shops the 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 unique variety um, even if it's just the variety of neighborhoods and almost um, subclimates from from the coves to the open beaches uh, the canyons the hilltops uh, the flatlands um, the interesting people. Well, Laguna obviously collects and, and holds a, a very varied and interesting group of people <laughs> um, in, in all shapes and forms. Uh, just it's, it's, it's beauty. Um, sure, there are drawbacks, the traffic and issues with parking, um, but I don't let that bother me. I know there are a lot of longtime Lagoonans that are, are really upset and, and bothered by the traffic. And it's, it's no fun if you're having to try to get someplace, but, but why are they all here? They're all here because of the reasons all of us locals originally were here and are still here is because of Laguna's beauty and everything that Laguna has to offer. And, and who, am I, who am I to criticize a visitor or a tourist coming into town to enjoy what I enjoy. I, I, I just, I, I don't see the logic in that. There are a lot of people that do do that though. Um, and, and I'm under the realization that there is probably not one place on this earth that stays the same and is the same as it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Everything changes, we change as people, our environments change. So I kind of take that under, uh, under the, the, the part of living here is, is if you, if you want to be someplace and it's someplace you love, sometimes there are maybe less than positive aspects that you have to put up with or deal with or accept. And, and I've always, I guess, just been a person to accept that contrast. I mean, there's still days. I, I live in North Laguna, two blocks from Heisler Park, where I walk across the highway and into Heisler Park on maybe one of those exceptional early fall days when we get a, a Santa Ana condition and the, the air visibility is super crystal clear. And I'll go out loud, holy bleep, but I don't say bleep. I can't believe I live here. And, and, and there really is that sensation, that feeling that I live where people paid a vacation. Yeah, um, I, um, that's very beautifully put. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, one of the things I love about you know your story is that you, um, through your history of, of you know, aside from Newport Beach, and you, you really just been local here, you know, all your life. I'm and, about as local as local can be. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. And uh, as local as local can be, but then at the same time, you didn't just live here and held a job or something like that. You did so many things that are local, you know, to Laguna, lifeguard, um, you know, art, uh, now photography, um, all kinds of these connections that 
are really very uniquely, you know, Laguna. You know, when you say, when like you say some to somebody, I'm a photographer um, in Laguna, that means something. Like if you say I'm a photographer in, you know, in Irvine, well, that doesn't really mean that much, you know? Well, and they're, they're amazing photographers all, over, all yeah. around the world that do amazing things. And obviously being a photographer is you can travel. So just because you live one place, I, I don't see it as a hindrance, but, but there might be a little cachet that comes with the address of Laguna. But Yeah, not taking anything away from the photographers at all, at all for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, just that, it's just that you shoot uniquely Laguna because you live here and you've seen so much here and you know what's unique here and you know what's typical. You know when stuff is happening. You know what's coming in and out and things like that. And so you just it's just a wealth of history that you carry with it, along with living here and working. You know, as an as an as an artist of many different ways here is what makes it uh, so interesting and so fascinating. You know, to me, you know, about talking with you, you know, at any given time. And so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on. It's just because because of this. You know, because of all these things that um, I just love to be around. The, the Laguna's um, unique landscape, you know, causes some of the traffic and congestion. But then the beauty of that is that we have all these beautiful hidden beaches and coves and things like that. Uh, unfortunately for, for some of us, like, okay, it's not too crowded yet. Not, not, not the whole entire, you know, uh, world knows about it because at least the entire world just goes right to main beach but at least they're not so crowded in, on some of the offshoot you know um uh, coves that i i love and so like you know i love showing them to people but like i tell them like you know because you know, <laughs> you know, just uh, up and down the coast you just don't see landscape like this you can you can take a look at newport these open beaches um uh, huntington you know, the same way, and there's not really that much of a beach, uh, and also really open down in San Juan Capistrano. There's nothing really like Laguna, and so we'll take, I'll take all that with whatever else that comes, if it's the traffic, it's the tourists, um, uh, that kind of thing, and I think that's what makes, uh, if you can see that beauty, you, I think most people will feel the same way, so I, I really appreciate you sharing, you know, all that today. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking and having me. It's uh, been an honor. Yeah, and I know you have a you have a quote to share. I do. I I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna read it. Yeah, please do. Please okay, do. you ready? Yeah. Okay. I really believe that if the political leaders of the world could see their planet from a distance of let's say 100,000 miles, their outlook would be fundamentally changed. The all important borders would be invisible that noisy argument suddenly silenced. The tiny globe would continue to turn, serenely ignoring its subdivisions, presenting a unified facade that would cry out for unified understanding, for homogenous treatment. The earth must become as it appears, blue and white, not capitalist or communist. Blue and white, not rich or poor. Blue and white, not envious or envied. Michael Collins from Apollo 11. And so appropriate. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we had 12 men walk on the moon, but there were additional three men for Apollo 8 that circled the moon, but never went to the moon. So 15, only 15 astronauts have ever had that view from the earth back, from the moon back to the earth. And um, Michael Collins, I think was, he passed away recently, was one of the most in-depth of the Apollo astronauts and really saw things in an interesting way. He really saw, he, he, he felt the, the importance of, of going to the moon and what it meant to mankind and had a way to distill it down into words um, whenever he spoke about the Apollo program. And um, I, I, think, I think all of us, if we could shift and have a bigger, wider picture, because too often we're looking at things with side blinders on and we get so focused on just what's in front of us 
we don't use our peripheral vision and we don't back away and and see what's going on you know uh, we, we're often caught up in maybe the the consequence of some actions but we don't understand what the actions were that that brought us to that point and a lot of people don't try to go back and and research we we get internet now and we've got so much information at our tips and yet when, when it comes to social media people want to rush to post something but aren't willing to take the time to research it a little bit and and check its background and see if if it's factual or not and um i think if everybody could just step back and slow down and take that that longer view um and use use some common sense and rationale um we seem to be really short on that these days uh common sense and and being rational and and logical progressive thinking if this happens then this happens and and one event uh, uh, triggers or, or forms another and and just put the pieces together and 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 not be so quick to judge just back up and slow down yeah perfectly well put i, I think um, all of us can all put the uh keep that in mind um you know like you said we have us there there's this thing that i used to always say i used to train people on my team and um, they, use, they tend to be young when they come in, they're like in their early 20s. And um, I said, hey, you know what? And, and people ask me like, how's your staff and things like that? And I would say, hey, you know what? They're great, they're young people. They, they can do anything, they can do anything. They have all this energy, they have all this passion and things and they can do anything, but they don't know anything. <laughs> and so, that just reminded me of that because similarly as as a society right now with the internet and everything we have so much information we can know everything you know but then we we don't take the time we, we don't we, we don't take advantage of this this it's this uh, weird thing that we have like oh it's all there but then you know you don't like you have a book you don't read it you, you know so um so thank you for sharing that um and uh, i think we can all all I'll put, uh, keep that in mind as we go forward and um, hopefully make, make all of our lives a little bit better and be able to share something significant and not just you know, anything that comes across our faces, right? That's right. Well, um, Mitch, thank you so much. Um, it's been a terrific time. This is probably one of my favorite uh, interviews just because oh, thank so you. much. It just, there's just so much. Um, um, the visuals are so rich and your story is, uh, um, amazing and enviable to me because I hadn't lived in Laguna forever. Um, and um, just the, all the adventures and the things you've done in, in life is, is very, um, very admirable. And the marathons for sure, you know, that's really great too. So um, anytime, I'd love to have you back again sometime. I'm sure, you know, as you shoot more and have more to share, I would love to have you back. And for all of you guys, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. Um, this was such a treat. Um, I you know, just couldn't, uh, couldn't get myself to stop because it just, you know, I just love everything that uh, Mitch had done and shared with us. So I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, so um, I'm going to have the replay up. Um, I also got a channel on YouTube where I put everything so it's easier to share, easier to view um, on a, uh, if you want to go, go back and, and watch the replays of previous uh, interviews as well. I have that link in the, in the post if you want to go check it out. Um, otherwise, um, I hope you all have a great night. And Mitch, um, I'm grateful for you, and I appreciate you um, taking the time and sharing sharing everything with it, with us. I've learned so much, Thank and you. I'm just gonna go and uh, you know try to digest everything. <laughs> and so, um, uh, hopefully, um, everybody got a chance to enjoy it as much as I did. So, uh, thank you, Mitch, and uh, we'll. I'll uh, see you guys all tomorrow where I bring another guest. I don't know who it is yet, but I'll surprise you. Um, so thank you very much. Have a good night and uh, be safe and take care. And I'll see you soon. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, everybody.